Salam sejahtera Malaysia. Happy day Malaysia. How are you? It's been some time since uh, Healthy Roja has been on air. We are here again today with a very different look, a very different feel. Uh, coming to you from Commune, a clear working space in Bangsa South. I'm looking forward to the new episodes coming. I been some time. Welcome back and hope to introduce you to more topics where health and wellness is very connected to every one of us inside out. Today we have, I have, uh, we, I have a friend today. Uh, I have a new co-host with me. His name is Dishan. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, thank you, everyone. This is the first new look and feel of the Healthy Roja podcast. Yes. We are going to be doing this uh, on podcast and also on video. So join us as we try to give you guys uh, a bit more content on health and wellness and me and edwin would be working together definitely for sure um and we are co-hosts so it's the first time us for us being co-hosts yeah, as well yeah. so, so we hope the chemist chemistry is good <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out bro. Yeah, Don't worry. okay yeah. so um we have a very special guest today as you can see Sitting right there with a very nice t-shirt, with a very nice shirt actually. I don't know where you got that shirt. You need not to tell telling me. you. You need to tell me where you got that shirt. Not That's telling actually you. a very nice shirt. So, okay. We have Dr. Prem Kumar Shanmugam, who is the Clinical Director of Solus Asia. Dr. Prem, thank you so much for joining us on our first episode. You are the number one first guest ever. Thank you for taking time. It's very early in the morning, um, on the weekend especially. Yeah, on a so Sunday morning. On a Sunday morning, yeah. So thanks, <laughs> thank thanks you, for thank coming thank on. You, thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank you. Give me a reason to wake up early today. So thank you for <laughs> having as long, me. As long as you get your coffee, right? As yes. As long as you get your coffee. Yes. Okay. So um, we're going to be talking about addiction. Yes. But before right. we kind of get into all of that technical things, like that, we want a Healthy Roja podcast is trying to focus also on personal stories and personal mm. achievements. So we want to talk to Dr. Prem and ask him what has been his story and his... Um, um, journey in addiction, Dr. Prem. Okay, thank you, boys, for having me. You know, it's it's. I first of all, I must say, I like the name of your show, Healthy Rojak. <laughs> that's that's thank very you. healthy, yeah. And Rojak, he, he came up with it. Really <laughs> it. So I was trying to understand Healthy Rojak. You know what that means, and I guess Rojak is very uh, in context to life as well. Uh, life is Rojak, right? Precisely. precisely. Expect the, an yeah. unexpected. Uh, a, a classic example of that would be the pandemic last year. Right. And um, we, 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 we should train ourselves to expect the most unexpected things in life. Right. And uh, that's where learning to adapt and manage life on life's terms um, is what I suppose is, this, this program is about. Precisely. I mean, it's, it's the stories of individuals that mm. uh, give the ability <clears throat> for the community to see. You know, things would resonate with them, but uh, we, we can't be identifying individuals specifically and telling our story. So... This way, we get the story out, right. and that would be able to help them. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you very much again for having me on the program. As I said, for the coffee and for waking me up early. <laughs> so, that's all you uh, need for Dr. Prem to come on your show. Just coffee. <laughs> and to wake him up early. <laughs> okay. So, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Prem, and uh, I'm a psychologist by training. Yeah, I, I'm a counseling psychologist, and uh, my main area of work is in addictions. Um, and compulsive disorders, and, and you know, I, I work a lot with families who struggle with dysfunctional structures and systems as a result of mental health-related issues. Now, I have not been doing this all my life. I have to first say, you know, um, I, I came into this field of work um, not because I wanted to, but because of my personal journey in life. Mm. Interesting. Um, since Dishan asked me that question, you know, to talk about myself, so maybe a little bit about myself, and then. Later, as we go on, I, I think I'll, I'll talk more about it. Sure. So I have had my personal battles with mental health and addictions-related issues myself. And uh, a big chunk of my life, I have to say, especially in my teens and um, early young adulthood, I struggled a lot with, with addictions. And at that point of time, uh, my family and myself, and, um, and as, as many of us would know, didn't know that this is a disease. Mm, yeah? So... We never knew, and even till today, I, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Not many people realize that addictions is a disease, and it's a di it's a mental health illness, and it can be treated. Uh, people who suffered, including myself, with uh, this disease for many years, uh, we were shunned away, or I was anyway, by the community, by the society, and and for the rightful reasons, right? Right. 
right. um, not functioning <coughs> as uh, as uh, as I should have, um, succumbed with the, into this disease, this illness, and getting worse and worse until there came a point of time when I had no choice but I had to get into recovery. And I say that because my recovery did not came did not come sorry because I wanted it to. Mm. Right. Though. That's- Interesting. Yeah, and I'll talk about it a little bit more yeah. later. Yeah, <laughs> though today my whole life revolves around my recovery and my career, my profession, my job, my passion. Everything in my life talks about it revolves around my recovery. But when I came into recovery, it was not by choice. It was not something I thought I could achieve. I never thought I could stop. My choice of drugs was alcohol, by the way. Mm. Right. So I, I was an alcoholic for the most of my young adulthood. Okay. Mm. And uh, that's what. Uh, uh, you know, intrinsically motivated me to change, shift my career, and get into this science and right. uh, this profession today. That's a little bit about me. Mm. So, so you were saying like alcohol addiction. How did it start? What was the reasons that that kind of pushed you to the brink of of getting into alcohol addiction and things like that? What would be okay? I think firstly to to understand that we need to grasp the concept that, as I said earlier, addiction is a disease. Mm. Okay. I mean that that that's something new. I must say. You okay. Know? Um, I I never thought of it as that. We always have this mindset that addiction is your choice. You chose to be. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. But okay. But being a disease is a. Yeah, yeah. That, but that's the narrative now that we're trying to portray because. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. You see. You see. We have known. What would you think? Normally, when I give a talk, I have this nice slide of a person who looks like an addict and a person who looks like a functioning person, right? Mm. And uh, <clears throat> what comes to mind when you think of addiction? You know, what comes to mind? What image comes to your mind when you think of someone who's suffering from addictions? A drug addict. Yeah. Yeah. And what? Who, what is a picture of a drug addict? Somebody Tom sitting clothes. down in some alleyway with like yeah. a needle poking <laughs> <into> <laughs> you know, All the schools and everything yeah. have been programmed, I mean, you know, in correct. school. Correct. No, no, all textbooks. the caricature exactly. and the texture. Textbook. Yeah. There'll be some guy sitting down there with a needle <laughs> in his long <laughs> hair. Jangan lah, big dada. All the nonsense. Yeah, dada, dada, just negara. That's what we grew up with, yeah. you see. Yeah. But the thing is, um, the addictions make or uh, lead people to become like that. Okay. okay, as a result of the disease or result of the the things that they do, but addiction in itself is a disease. Now, there is a thirty to fifty percent genetic predisposition, and that's this. scary. Yeah, that's it, scary. Is, it is. We've okay. talked about this. Is it's very yeah, scary actually? It is. Yeah. Thirty to forty percent. Fifty. Thirty to fifty. Yeah. Predisposition. Yeah. The Which chemical means, imbalances yeah. in your brain, right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, as a result, as a result of deficiency in the brain, so <laughs> many of us who have uh, a family. Right. Or family history of uh, addictions, or even mental health illnesses right. doesn't necessarily have to be. Well, if, uh, it doesn't mean if I'm an alcoholic, I'm a recovering alcoholic. My son or daughter is going to be one. It doesn't mean that, right. but it puts them at a 30 to 50 percent higher risk of getting a mental Into. disease. Uh, sorry, a, a, a mental health disease. Right, right, but, right. But that's the thing. So mental health issues and addiction. Let's say if my dad was an alcoholic, and it doesn't predispose me to become an alcoholic. It could predispose me to become addicted to something else. Yeah, the addiction possibly. is that that we want to be addicted to something. something. It yeah. could be uh, gaming. It could Correct. be pornography. Right. It could be you know gambling, trading, Gam- gambling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are trigger factors. Right? Yes, right. yes. But this what I'm talking about now is genetic predispositions. Okay. Mm. Triggers are more psychological. Ah, okay. 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 So now we are just looking at the biological aspects. All right, I understand. And and now as Dishan said earlier, which is also true. And there is also a deficiency in chemicals or neurotransmitters in the brain uh, for people who have addictive personality or suffer from addictions. Okay. Um, compared to the, the, the normal people, for example, you know, if, if you enjoy a glass of beer, you go to the pub or you go to the club, you can have one or two beers and you can stop it. Right. But a person or a person like me, if a, the drink beer goes into my system, I cannot stop it. Right. Mm. Okay. 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 I lose control because it triggers a, a, a chemical reaction in my brain, and once that happens, my reward system of the brain gets hijacked, and I lose control. Uh, okay. So the choice, and you were right, Edwin. Yeah, the first choice of picking up the drink is a choice. Okay. But once I've picked it up, I lose choices anymore. I've lost my the options for making make the choice. choice. Yeah. To stop. Yeah. yeah. Because then the reward system takes over, and we know the brain is extremely powerful. Once the reward system is hijacked, the rational part doesn't function so well, right. and I lose control. Mm. So I cannot drink, and I cannot drink because I'm allergic to alcohol. Mm. Simple as that. 
So what about people who can control, but yeah. they drink a lot? Like functioning alcoholics, okay. you call it. Yeah, okay. So there are people who can function in the society, right? Yes. So when that is, would that be an issue? Because I know a lot of people who are functioning alcoholics. Yes. Every day they have to drink. Yes. But they're fine. Yes. So, so and this is a question uh, I hear quite often. People ask me, "When do you know that it's an addiction?" Mm. Right. Yeah, I mm. suppose that's what you're asking me, Richard. Yeah. Correct. And a simple answer to that, I would say, is it becomes an addiction when your life is unmanageable. Okay. Okay. You have no control of yeah. what you're, I mean, how you function. Yeah. Without it, you feel that you are lacking. Yeah. So, okay, in that context, for, for people who are watching or listening mm-hmm. to the podcast, I would say, say, say let give an example of a person who, let's say he's uh, a very high-functioning CEO of a company. He takes alcohol every day, but the company flourishes and he's fine. So mm. that doesn't define as an addiction. Okay, now what may happen as a result of that? Mm. Uh, he's functioning. Mm-hmm. He's able to to go to work and come back. He's able to control. I mean, he's able to drink. He's able to manage his life. Mm. Now, what may happen after a while is, you see, we also need to appreciate that the body builds a tolerance. Okay. okay? Mm. This is quite organic. We all do that. Correct. We become adaptable. I need my coffee in the morning, or I can't function. Mm. Every morning, I need a coffee. If I continue doing that, I may need two glasses of coffee. After uh, a while, I'll need three glasses uh, of coffee. Okay. After a while, I can't sleep. I need to have my coffee even to sleep. It's actually what's happening to me now, but <laughs> that's another episode. That's another episode. <laughs> we'll talk about coffee addiction. Coffee addiction. <laughs> but uh, so what may happen to this CEO is that it will be a matter of time when his brain is so conditioned to needing the alcohol to function. Mm. He's going to get up in the morning and he's going to think, "I have to have my beer before I can function." Mm. Okay. Mm. Then he's going to have a time will come when he says, "I need to have my beer at the ten o'clock break because I can't think after ten thirty." Right. So he's going to drink more and more and more. Now the next phase for that would be, and since it's alcohol, the biological part of the bo- body is going to start failing. Mm. Um, liver, you know, kidney, diabetes, hypertension, yeah. and all those other things will start to slowly, uh, you know, uh, give warning signs. Mm. That's with alcohol. So we also need to understand that different drugs cause different kind of damage okay. to okay. the body. Okay? okay, alcohol, these yeah, organs, yeah, yeah. Um, ice, meth. As, uh, I think many of us will be familiar with ice, right? Smoking. Smoking. Is, uh, uh, so hang on, meth damages the brain. Okay. 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 We'll go to the hard ones. First. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll go to the hard ones. If you were to break up addictions, the types of addictions that people have, and how it associates okay. to all the the uh, the usage of this uh, bad avenues that they let go. Mm. So alcohol is one of it. Mm. Uh, uh, meth is ice. One mm. is one of them. Mm. So how 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 does that happen? Okay, so let's look at addictions as a group. Okay. There are two major types of dependency that uh, we can get stuck onto, okay? okay? One is chemical or substance, okay. alcohol, right. drugs, um, even coffee. Right. Um, anything that's chemical related. Okay. Another group is called behavioral addictions. Mm-hmm. Behavioral addictions are things like uh, internet, gaming, gambling, you mentioned earlier. Right. Yeah? Uh, these are non-substance related. Okay. Pornography. Um, pornography. Mm. Uh, we have seen a rise in gaming and internet addiction since yeah. the lockdown. Mm. Uh, we have received a lot of. Uh, we received a lot of calls from families and schools even about okay. how to manage because the kids are now locked on. Uh, yeah, on I, to, I can imagine. Yeah, they were, time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because they were stuck at home. You can't blame yes. them. They didn't yeah. have anything else to do. And if you know, if you if you re- heard in the newspaper recently, seventy percent of these SPM fellows didn't want to take the yes. exam. Yes. Yes. Why? What happened? Mm. They can't function. Mm. They can't focus because the last two years they were literally glued onto the screen. Yeah. You see, some so of them now, want to be YouTubers. <laughs> yeah, some <laughs> of them want to be YouTubers exactly. So, so two types of addictions. Now, the damage it causes, of course, it varies personally and from a family perspective, but it affects the same part of the brain, which is called the reward system. Whether it's chemical or whether it's behavioral addictions, okay, mm, mm. something happens in the reward system of the brain where they are conditioned to depend, whether it's a chemical or whether it's a, a, a behavior. So, so if a person is say addicted to pornography mm. and if they don't watch pornography and they don't like that, that becomes like the brain asks for it, right? Yeah. There is a, a need for them to do it. Yeah. And but if they can control the need, that's fine. But if they cannot control the need that affects their livelihood and their lives and their family and the people Correct. around them, Correct. then it's where you guys... That's a problem. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. 
Yeah. You see. So just uh, just one minute. So uh, sorry. To our viewers, you'll be right back after this. Keep it locked on to the Healthy Roja podcast. We'll be right back, guys. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Doctor Prem, you were talking about uh, pornography addiction, how that affects. So I was asking you, like, if a person can control it and it doesn't affect their livelihood, but they still watch pornography every day, mm. where do you kind of draw the line? It's not an addiction, addiction because mm-hmm. it's a functioning addict, basically, mm. right? Sounds like you're asking for yourself, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a bit worried now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, because this is very interesting because <laughs> pornography it's it's a very um uh, what you call it i've had uh, a personal story on a friend who mm. let's say in university he was a straight a student and, and had a very strict family right and when he went to university he was in uh, when we were studying together we have freedom as, mm. as students right in university and he kind of didn't know what to do with the freedom right and then he kind of figured out how to get pornography and then it became where he didn't go to class he mm. dropped out of university right. i mean that I mean, that's that's like what doctor was saying so right? it's, it's an addiction, addiction like, because you know, like, he's never been exposed to it yeah. and me being a parent right now i'm thinking about it like my kids my son my daughter whoever everybody watches pornography this is something that we have to say out, out there mm. everybody watches pornography there's a lot of different ways to do it you know and things like that mm. but how do we know and how do I, as a parent, try to control that and try to expose it, but don't make them like culture shock when they go out to the mm. university? That case that happened to my friend does not happen to another person. Mm. Okay. So the exposure is, is important. So th- one of the topics that I mm. want to talk about is just that specific pornography addiction. Like, how much is too much, and do we really need to like don't watch it at all? Mm. But then when they get their hands on it, it can lead to an addiction because it's something that it's so you know that's it's, we forbade it means people are more interested young, younger people are more interested mm. in something that we forbade we tell mm. them no they want to do it mm. but, but that's true right not only where addiction or porn is concerned I think mm. life in itself uh, if you notice when someone is too much confined in a space and then they're given the freedom without the awareness and the, or, or given the ability to get that awareness then the, the repercussions of that could be very detrimental to their Mm. Yeah, yeah, speaking about what is your thoughts on, on that? Like, like as a person or as a parent, what do we kind of need to to look at in that sense of trying to expose mm. them or not letting them, not exposing them at all? Okay. Even drugs, even like you say, uh, marijuana, mm. you know, meth, you know, things like that. There are ways to get it. If you are in bad company, there is ways for you to procure these things. Definitely. Yeah. But what can you kind of prepare your your parent, uh, your your children. kids, children, or even your mm. friends mm. or your brothers or sisters and tell them you can do it, but, or you can be exposed to this, but how do you let them have that thought in their mind? It's still bad for my health. It's still, you know. Mm. Okay. It's still detrimental to my well-being my well-being yeah. okay so 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 as you as you as you guys were talking yeah, yeah. i was just thinking let uh, how best to address this right. question mm. now let's go back to the basis okay Wait, yes. let's go back a little bit to the science behind this whole concept of addictions and, sure. and needs and wants uh, and as you said you know people do this yeah right now look if we we all know about the 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 talk with the parliament now in the politicians about Banning the generational end game. Yes, yes, correct. Okay, that's the <laughs> second <laughs> <of> this. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm already thinking how to bring all the details. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so look, guys, we're going to ban nicotine. Do you think people are going to stop smoking? Nope. Do you think there's going to be uh, the two, those who were born in 2000 and what what seven. was it? seven seven right? Are never going to pick up a stick again? Mm. Let's let's be practical, things, right? Yeah, if, if it's going to happen. Yeah. There's there's talk about uh, influx of neg- what you call illegal cigarettes coming into yes. the market. Correct. There's talk about contraband, blah 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 blah. We have been trying to ban drugs for years. What have we achieved? Correct. We hang people with drug related issues. What have we achieved? And yet here you are with a rehab. And look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a rehab full of patients. <laughs> yeah. You know, but banning is not the right solution. Mm-hmm. And that's where we talk about sustainable recovery now. Okay. Um, sustainable recovery is helping people recover but in a sustainable way you tell them no they're going to do it you tell me don't drink the coffee I will drink the coffee 
That's how we are. That's how human beings Nature are made up. Yeah. yeah. And more so for the younger generation because these kids or these people are very, very intelligent. Yeah. We have more and more intelligent younger generation coming about now because, not so much because they're organically brilliant, I think, but because of the influx of information mm. that is coming through the internet. Yeah. That's true. Right? That's true. On your yeah. 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 You go to the doctor nowadays, Before you tell the doctor what medication you want. Correct. <laughs> the doctor asks you, hey, what about you? What about you? Yeah. You give a list, right? Yeah. List, yeah. And then the, when the doctor prescribes something, you tell the doctor, uh, this one, no, because it's got side effect. This one, no. <laughs> we all MBBS already yeah, now. Yeah, without yeah. going to university, right? Yeah, yeah. So, banning is not the solution. But look at the irony of things in Malaysia, okay? We are going to ban nicotine, but guess what? We're talking about legalizing medical yeah. marijuana next year. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a bad thing. Not it's, a bad not, thing. it's not, but it's without not. control, what do you think is going to happen? Precisely yeah. where we were I have to start cool. another solace. <laughs> of your solaces. We'll have another episode then. Yeah. <laughs> but going back to your question, Nishan, okay? Uh, now, bearing, yes, is not a solution, I think. And many of us professionals or academics will tell you that. Do you yeah. want to call it sustainable exposure? Or well, or? there are two ways to treat people. Mm. One is the abstinence model, mm. which means no. And it works for some. For me, personally, as I said, alcohol is my allergy. I cannot drink. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as I go to the pub today and have one or two beers and stop. Mm -hmm. It will not work for me. Yeah. Because I know when it goes in, it's going to trigger something in my reward so system. So like cold turkey, you stop. That's it. Okay. But how do I stay stop? There's a science behind that. Mm -hmm. I have to go for therapy. I have uh, counselling. I have uh, you know, my support system. And I still do, till mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to drink, but I don't want to put myself in a risk. Yes. Or at a risky situation and because it's, it's like a prolonged thing. It's yeah. your your battle. Yeah. You're gonna have it I, th I think you mentioned something very important there. Support mm. system. Yes. Mm. I think support system is the essence of how someone comes out of. Oh yeah. You know it 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 it, it is the one place where someone can fall back to, no matter what, and uh, yeah. many a times we don't see this happening. Yeah. Because yes. we ostracize them like almost immediately. Oh yeah, because you push them away. Correct. Mm. Correct. Uh, that's what happened to me in my life. Correct. You see, but now, back to a little bit about me, right? Uh, I come. From, I'm the eldest in the family of four. Both my parents were teachers, academics, you know, school principal, Indian family. Um, eldest nephew, eldest grandson in the whole. So you had a lot of yeah uh, checklists. Yes, check yes. <laughs> Be like Anna. Do like Anna. Yeah. Get A like Anna. Yeah, yeah. So huge responsibility and huge uh, thing that I had to carry my shoulder, pressure, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is fine. I didn't feel it at that point. It was lots of attention. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, when I came to uh, an age, I think I was 16 or 17, I started experimenting with alcohol. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Alcohol did everything that I, I, I needed. Right. Mm -hmm. It kept me to focus. Right. You know, I could write beautiful love letters. Right. The boys loved me because I could write letters for them to give their <laughs> girlfriends. <laughs> You know? You're an entrepreneur <laughs> even before becoming yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And what I get in return beers. <laughs> The attention, you know, the, 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 the whatever attention that I got at home because I was the eldest, I got it in the community because I was a good drunk. <laughs> okay, now that continued for a long time. Then, as we grew up, 20, 21, I could drink and drive while the rest fell down, you know, they couldn't drink uh, because my tolerance was organically high. Right. Naturally, my body loved it and it made me function, you see, for a while, for a while. 23, 22, 23, the rest of the gang completed uni and they went on, but I couldn't. Because alcohol took over my life. I needed it to function. Literally. By the time I was 25, I think, I was drinking in the morning when I got up because my hands would shake. Would yeah, yes. Right. Then I would. I had no career. I had no job. I had no money. It was too embarrassing for the family. So I ran away from home. Okay. By choice. Because it was too embarrassing. Totally understand. Right? I mean, that's it's a like, culture. That's yeah, it's a cultural in, thing. Right? Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. talking about Asian culture, yeah, culture earlier. Yeah. Disappointment yeah. of the family. Yes, <laughs> you're a disgrace. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, uh, the burden itself would push you and drive you to do yeah. things. Yeah, and, and, and like. I don't blame the family because it was too much for them to, yeah. to care. Mm -hmm. My dad tried everything he could to get me well, but it didn't work because they were not treating me. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that I had to be treated. It's not their fault. Yeah. We, I didn't know either. Yeah. Now, Life went on, 27, 28, 29, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. I was falling sick, I had liver-related issues, you know, I had blah, blah, blah. I was doing all kinds of odd jobs. I didn't have, I couldn't complete my education. Right. Then yeah. one day I thought, I mean, as life went on, I thought, okay, this is it. Mm. This so is my life. The realization came from yourself. The realization came that I will never change. 
you that is what I meant earlier. You accepted, accepted what who and who yes, you are inside yes. out. I think that is something people don't do. Well, it's difficult to do. There are pros and cons to that okay. because when I accepted myself as being a drunk, I never wanted to progress. Mm. Let me explain were, that. You were all right with okay, it. Okay, okay. I was all right with it. Yeah. So I left home, I ran away from home, and I lived in a community where I was accepted as well, with other drunks, okay. with other addicts. Okay, and I, I know this could be a shocker looking at someone who's dressed with a blue shirt today, <laughs> but that's... A very nice blue shirt. Yeah. A very nice blue where you shirt. Got it from. Yeah. <laughs> who's a, a psychologist and who's got all these qualifications, but when I accepted this was my life and I thought I would just die like this one day, either in the drain or on the roadside or in an accident, and that's how I accepted myself. Right. What, what happened one day was... I had something called alcohol-induced amnesia. Okay. I left home and I didn't know how to go back because my brain forgot. Uh, I was picked up. My family reported me as lost and missing and I was in the hospital. This happened in Singapore. And when I woke up, I met a doctor, to cut a long story short, and this psychiatrist told me, he said, you're not well. And I said, no. He said, no, you're not well. I said, what's wrong with me? He said, it's a disease. I said, what disease do I have? He said, it's called addictions. Right. First time in my life when I'm 30 years old and someone told me I have a disease. Nobody told me I have a disease. Everybody thought it's like, you, you are, it's yeah. something wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> they said, you are useless, you're an embarrassment, you are a disgrace to the right. community, Najis Masharakat. Yeah. All this, you know, was conditioned. And words kind of like stick to you and they play in your mind. Yeah, of course. And, and it just drives you even deeper. Yeah, right? because what, you accept it. What, what, what did you feel at that moment? When I, when I heard it was a disease? Yeah. Uh, a blank. I was blank. Right. My brain was literally frozen and blank. And I was like, what? I'm not well? Yeah, I know I've got liver issues. No, dude, there's nothing to do with your liver, it's your brain. <laughs> now, that was the moment when I said earlier, I, it was not a choice that I wanted to recover. Okay. But that moment made me think, you know what? Maybe it's worth living and maybe this guy is making some sense. Right. Let's try and listen to him after I've got nothing to lose. Right. Now, from that day on till now, I must say, life has never been better. Right. Never. My worst days today are still better than the best days when I was drunk. Wow. That's because I can think. Profound. Yes. Yeah. Very profound. Yeah. yeah. Because my brain functions, you see. I right. don't need a glass of alcohol to function. Right. Which I never thought I could in the past, you see. So that realization, guys, we, for everyone who's listening out there, and if you have a family member or, or if you yourself are struggling with some kind of mental illness or, or an addiction, please, you're just not well. That's it. It's yeah. just like the flu. What is the difference? Exactly. Get professional help. Mm. So see a doctor. Yeah. yeah. So when I realized that, you know, or when this doctor told me this, um, uh, that I was, I was uh, you know, I was not well, my first, next question was, how do I get well? Mm. I wanted to live. Yeah. I wanted to function. And, and, and then, you know, it progressed slowly. So when, when things became clearer for me, I could think, I could study, you know, I could read, I could go back to university. And that's how I went back to school, to university, and I studied. And I told myself, this would be my life's mission to educate myself, uh, to find the science behind it, appreciate the science behind it, and bring this science to the community. So people can understand that, look, you're not a bad fellow. You're not actually a disgrace to the community. Yeah. But you can make a difference. I, I think that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's very beautiful. Yeah. I, I think that's what we want to get the community to understand, that um, you said something that life... Uh, you wanted to live life, mm. right? Mm. You wanted, because of that information that doctor gave you, you thought for yourself and life became more... There was, there was hope. Exactly. Yeah. Hope. Yeah. Was and, hope. And, exactly. and I must say, hope is so important these days. That mm. we, I mean, over the last two years, we see it just vaporized because we did, could not see the light at the end of Correct. the tunnel. Correct. But I think things are picking up Correct. these days and, and hope is something that we need to hold on to. No matter how bleak things look like, be hopeful because it will never disappoint. Yeah, but yeah, but that, that's the thing. So for, for me, what, what, was, what was I think <coughs> very interesting is that change of perspective. There's not some, there's, I'm like this to I'm suffering from something mm. and how do I recover? That's mm. the perspective. Not the addict, the person has to have, but also the support system, the family. Oh, yeah, yeah. The That's the next phase. Yes, yeah. you're right. If I have a, a friend or a child or a brother or somebody that, that is an addict or suffering from something, I need to think, stop thinking that he's, he, that's how he is, mm. he's chosen this. Mm. No, it's a disease. Mm. It's something that you can recover from. Mm. It's like the flu. 
mm. get professional help. Correct. Follow the treatment and you'll get better. Mm. Correct. I have to agree with you. And and also, you know, you both you, you boys are talking about the support system and yeah. family and, and, and the structure and the system. That's the next phase of recovery, which is essential. Um, my recovery, I, I, I'm very blessed in that sense because I have fantastic family that accepted me back. Uh, I had a fantastic support system, not only at home, but also in the community and the friends around me. Amazing. Yeah, so that was amazing for me. I, I mean, I, I'm extremely blessed and I'm grateful for that. And uh, I think we need to extend that kind of support system to others who are suffering out there. Because if they want to get well, they can. It's, it's our responsibility to help them get well. Because I used to think I will never get well. Mm. This is exact. There are many places today in the whole of Malaysia, mainly in Kuala Lumpur, where I drive past or if I go and I have memories of my past. Mm. And I have slept in that bus stop or I have you know, walked those streets or I have fallen in that drain before as a drunk, as an addict. I remember it very clearly. And today when I go past those places, I, I, if I can reach out to someone and help, I try and do it. Because I think it's my responsibility, it's my duty, you see. Yeah. So I think that is something that we all can share. You don't have to be uh, in, an addict or you don't have to be in recovery to appreciate another person who's suffering, you know. You don't have to. But you have real Understand experience. The yeah, but you have real experience. Like, yeah, the that best gives doctor because you're like, I was an addict. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to complain that you can't recover. Hello, look at me, man. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to look at you, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> but, 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 but that's, that's true. So you found a sense of purpose Yeah. from yeah. that point where you Correct. realized that self-realization that you can make a difference Correct. being a person yeah. and you started that journey and solace is probably the, the manifestation of it that is. purpose. It is. Yeah. So maybe you can talk a bit about solace yeah. and then Just, maybe... So, uh, yeah. you know what? We'll be right back. After this, after, this? after these messages, we'll be right yeah. back. Yeah, Dr. Prem, you were saying um, that I asked a very good question. Oh, <laughs> yes. And uh, you want to answer the question, so please okay. take your time and answer the good question. <laughs> don't tell me to take my time. You'll regret it. <laughs> yeah, we don't have time actually. We need to like, move things along. Yeah. Okay. No, no, earlier you, you posed a very good question. You were talking about pornography and you were talking about control and uh, setting exposure. in exposure, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I got a bit carried away with, with the other topics and I didn't answer that. Let me try and, and tackle that. Now, again, going back to the science of that, okay? You said, you see, as I said earlier, addiction is a result of a deficiency in the reward system of the brain. Now, the reward system all of us have is something that's very important for us to feel rewarded. Okay, you feel nice, you feel happy, you feel a sense of achievement. Um, you you enjoy my coffee in the morning. What's happening is that when I have that first cup of coffee, it triggers the dopamine in my brain to fire, which makes me feel good and nice and rewarded. Mm -hmm. The next day, my brain will tell me, hey, it's 8 o'clock, where's that caffeine? So it triggers the same part of the brain again, it makes me fire. Now, after a while, like I said, you'll need more and more of the same coffee. Drugs, sex, alcohol does the same thing to the dopamine. Mm, okay. Okay? okay. When you are having sex, when you are in, uh, you know, uh, experiencing that orgasm, that mm. moment, yeah, mm. it's a boom on the dopamine. Yeah. It's like a wow yeah. kind of a thing. And that couple of minutes or couple of seconds is that complete rush. Yeah. It's nice. That's mm. why people want to do it over and over again. Mm. Um, anything that's rewarding, human nature, we want to do it over and over again. Right. It's natural. It's You want to feel good. You want to feel happy, right? Pornography, drugs, alcohol, does that to the brain. So it's only natural that we go back to things that are feeling make us feel good. Mm. So, pornography, as you said, is something that we all have access to. It's part of human nature. It's sex. It's a drive. Mm. Uh, one of Sigmund Freud's theories was that we are created to what is that? To recreate and protect ourselves. Mm. So we are supposed to recreate. That means we have to keep our human mankind going by having sex and babies and da da da, and defend ourselves from being attacked and destroyed. Mm. Okay. So it's only natural. You can't remove that. Mm. Now, that if, therefore, uh, anything sex-related, pornography and all that, is attracts people. Okay. So it's only normal that we're going to go and do it over and over again. But when you do it too many times, it becomes compulsive. When it becomes compulsive, it becomes conditioned. It becomes conditioned, it becomes an addiction. Ah, so ah. that's the thing. The compulsive and conditioned. Maybe you can just very okay. quickly explain. So, what does that mean? I think what we need to do to answer your question is, especially with kids, like, yeah, you need to have timing. You need to tell them. I mean, don't go tell them you can watch pornography from 8 to 10. You can't do that. Mm. That doesn't make sense, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> we need to educate kids. It is already happening in schools. We have sex education. 
we have uh, yeah we have sex education topics subjects in schools where people openly talk about it the use of condoms the use of uh, what do you call um, uh, safe sex mm. Right. Mm. Mm. Uh, telling you, okay so so talking about that so sorry for interrupting but talking about that sex education is something to create awareness for younger kids in school if they are young adults they want to start having sex and things like that how do you have safe sex you don't want to have an unwanted pregnancy and things like that yeah but pornography and being addicted to porn, do you think schools need to talk to kids about it like you it's accessible it makes you feel good but there are drawbacks to it as well talking about things and giving that awareness so if i'm a 17 year old boy who's watching pornography every day after one i'm like am i addicted to this having that thought and that question that inner reflection of something isn't that due to the awareness he receives and the exposure he receives yeah I'm talking about the issues in school so do you think that that could be a topic possibly for in schools which i don't know what will happen but we can hope and pray. actually i think it's already happening this mm. i know there are schools where they're talking about this already oh. with the school counselors yeah that's, that's, mm. that's a good thing mm. Mm. Good. okay um, the counselors are talking to kids you know uh, 16 17 years. that's when the hormonal yeah. changes yeah. happen yeah, 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 yeah. curiosity kicks in you all know. of us were teenagers we yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of us still think we are it's called denial <laughs> and it's a whole different topic <laughs> <There's another. laughs> but yeah i mean yeah having that that conditioning um, so yeah, you you are sorry for interrupting. But I just wanted to get that point across. But yeah, you're talking about compulsive and addiction, addict, being addicted to mm. it. Yeah. So why, what what was those? So when you repeatedly do something mm. that fires the reward system of the brain, and the brain likes it, then you're conditioning your behavior to do it over and over and over again. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you're conditioning it to do it over and over again, a matter of time, you're going to need it. When you're going to need it, you can't function without it, and that's when you've crossed the line and become an addiction. So okay. you need to have that self awareness. You need to have self awareness initially. Mm. But once you've crossed the line self awareness doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's when supervision. Right. Parenting. Mm. Correct. Uh schools comes in. So going back to your question, I think what can help is education number one. Telling them is not wrong. It's not wrong to talk about sex, it's not wrong to talk about masturbation, it's not wrong uh, to talk about uh, what you call um, safe sex or, or birth control. It's not right. wrong. Right. Uh it's educational. Correct. Okay, we need to start talking. But number two is to put in check, check, checks, lah. Okay. Yeah. Controlled yeah. use of the laptop or internet or whatever. I, th- I think that's important because now that they know how it works, then there is a tendency of okay, let's test and see mm. how it works, mm. and that could mm. lead mm. to a whole other Pandora's box being opened, mm. yeah. which we mm. might not want to get into, mm. but. Um, Bringing that awareness and education would also need safeguards. Mm. Oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what you were saying, keeping tabs <laughs> on what they are, you know, watching on the laptop yeah. or, or on TV and, and stuff like that. But how how does that happen? I mean, how would you detect that? You know, maybe something's off or some. I well, mean, because there are signs definitely. Right? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are I'm signs. I'm sure you'll be able yeah. to. Okay, for example, yeah. Normally, I would tell a family, yeah. right, or a family member. When they say, um, you know, uh, doctor, my son, ah, da 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 da, you know, I'm seeing, ah, da 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 da, I think ah, he's taking drugs. Then you know what I would say? If you think he's taking drugs, the chances are you're right. Uh, the okay. Is always there. Yeah, mm. because you will not suspect or accuse if it's normal behavior. If it's normal. Mm. Yeah. So you're observing something which is abnormal, which is out of the norm. Right. So there's something that's not right. Follow your gut feel. Follow your gut feel. Okay. And sadly, yeah, see, with substance addictions and behavior addictions, yeah, sadly, I say sadly because we see that behavioral addictions take a long time to, for us to identify the symptoms. You see the, the damages only much later. Substance addictions, when the guy is drunk, you know he's drunk, right? <laughs> when he's high on drugs, you know he's high, right? But a gambler, when the guy has lost all his money, you only know when the along comes to the house or the credit cards, you know, the bank from the credit cards, uh, sorry, the letters from the banks start coming, which is probably months later. So damage has already taken place, you see? But an alcoholic, you know the next day is having a hangover. He won't be getting up. Like... Edwin couldn't get up this morning to come. <laughs> it was late. <laughs> not to say Edwin's alcohol. No, no, no. Just, like, <laughs> not that he had a heavy night last night. He just almost slept. But yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I understand what you're trying to say. So, so um, 
it's been a wonderful conversation. We have so much more to talk about. We don't have the time. So yes. let's just move on to what Solus Asia is currently doing. Okay. Talk a bit about sustainable recovery. You had a conference recently. Yeah. And then we'll move to a call of action to anybody watching what they can do. Okay. So, so Solus is, yeah, we are an addiction treatment specialist facility center. We were the first in Malaysia. Uh, when I started this, uh, I started, Sol I wanted to start Solus in Singapore because my training and my practice and even my recovery comes from hospitals in Singapore. But we couldn't due to, you know, red tape and, and stuff like that. So I started Solace in Sabah uh, for medical tourism purposes. In 2019, we moved to Kuala Lumpur. We moved the whole facility here. We have a full team of clinicians. Um, half of our patients are foreigners. They come from the Middle East and Australia and, you know, those countries. Uh, the, the remaining 50-60% are local simulations. Now, it's a residential program, but over the years what happened is we realized not everyone can afford residential treatment financially or the time. So we started a clinic. And uh, it's an outpatient clinic, which is picked up very well as well, where we see patients seeking treatment on an outpatient basis. Okay. Then again, over the years, we realized addictions was not the only issue. Addiction comes with a whole package of comorbidities. Psychological issues, depression, anxiety, stress, family-related issues, marital issues, you know, relationship issues. So we expanded our services to cater to those services as well. Then, then again in 2000 and I think 20 with the pandemic and the COVID situation, mental wellness, mental health issues became another big topic that we needed to tackle. Uh, and we started uh, uh, mental health services separately, which led us to an employee assistance program, which has become quite uh, busy and active now. So over the years we have grown our services and uh, now we have clinics in different countries uh, like in Singapore, um, in the Middle East, in Dubai, uh, and recently in the Maldives, we have set up outpatient clinics as well um, to help those who cannot come here seek treatment there. Um, and personally, for me, something that has been very, um, you know, that, that my personal interest is the academy. Nice. Mm. So Solis started an academy where we are training and sharing the technology and the research we find. We do lots of we do some research R and D. Mm. Okay. And we share this with the community, which led to the recent conference that you mentioned. Edma. Edma, right. yeah. Uh, evolving treatment methodologies in addictions. Mm -hmm. We have seen how not only addictive disorders have changed and evolved, but the treatment methodologies need to change accordingly as well. Mm -hmm. If we don't change the way or we don't tackle the diseases the way the diseases are evolving, they won't get well. I guess we have to be relevant to our times and seasons. We have to be very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, as practitioners ourselves, we have to keep ourselves updated. I have to review my own methodologies of treating people. Because it's not about my recovery, it's about their recovery. True. True. What works for me may not work for them. Correct. So, uh, Solace has evolved over the years and there's more we are planning to do, definitely. Okay. What would, what would be um, a call to action? Let's say somebody's listening to this podcast and somebody's watching us on all the social media platforms, what would be your call to action if they know someone who they think, like you said, there's this instinct and this gut feeling that something's wrong, it's yeah. normal behavior. What would they do if they are in a position where their loved one or their child is, is they think is suffering through something, what should they do? Okay, if you think you or someone at home is suffering from an illness, please assume that you're right and call for help. Okay? Don't try and treat them, don't try and advise them. Be there for them. Listen to them. Advice doesn't work, guys. <laughs> I've had thousands of people advise me when I was struggling. Mm -hmm. I was not willing to listen because I thought I was too smart for myself, first of all. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and the fact that you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The only, pers only people that helped me change or, or accept change were the professionals. Not my family, not my you know, friends. They loved me to bits. And they still do. And you love your you you love your loved ones. That's why you're there for them and you care. But you can't cure them. Mm -hmm. You can't treat them. Call for help. If even if you think um, you can't afford treatment, it doesn't matter. Call us. We'll refer you. We'll make sure we'll get you the right help somehow. Don't allow affordability to be a barrier for treatment. That's not fair. All human beings deserve to live a very well, as you said, Edwin earlier. We deserve to be well. We deserve to be happy. Mental wellness is. Um, basic need human right mm. all right thank right. you dr Prim. thank you thank you dr Prim. Uh, yeah <laughs> thank uh, you so much edwin yeah closing statements so um 
Warga Malaysia. We 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 started this Healthy Roja uh, some time ago with an intention to bring awareness and education to the community. We are going to bring even more very relevant, very communal topics because we believe that health is your choice. Health is your choice. You have the power to be healthy. Take a look in the mirror and ask yourself, I have this life as a gift. What am I going to do with it? And if someone is, someone is going through a difficult time, love on them like what Dr. Nen. Love on them by, well, he also said, don't advise them. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, generally, people don't like to hear advice. But they love to be listened to. Yeah. Listen to them. And you will know what to do. Believe, I believe in you. And I believe in Malaysia. And we're going to bring even more interesting, relevant, timely topics. Keep it locked on to us. I hope the best for you. You know, have faith, be hopeful, and love life and love the people around you. God bless. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Healthy Roja Podcast, Episode 1 with Dr. Prem from Solus Asia. If you liked what you heard, please follow us on all our social media platforms, the Healthy Roja on Instagram, and also please follow Solus Asia and Dr. Prem. They're coming up with a few programs. He does a yes. lot of live Instagrams as well with a lot of different people. Yeah. Follow us, enjoy the conversation. We will see you in the next episode. Goodbye. Thank you.